Good morning to another beautiful Sunday. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, just a quick couple of reminders. Um, we want to keep our mask on to remain six feet apart for social distancing, keep our distance on our floors, and keep the floor paths going. We're all doing our part to make sure that we prevent the spread of COVID. Thank you, guys. Also, um, Holy Communion's a little different. It's served at our seats now uh, for the time for the season. And we just ask that you stand up when the minister enters the empty row. And if you're a gluten-free participant, remain standing that you can receive the gluten-free alternative to Holy Communion. As well, we love to sing, but unfortunately at this time, we encourage our congregation to hum our hearts out. And this is to avoid the particles from spreading everywhere and getting everybody sick. This is greatly appreciated. But it's so fantastic to see everybody here and it's a new year, and I think it was a new year last Sunday too, but it, it, doesn't, change, it doesn't change the fact that it's a new beginning. And thinking of beginnings, if we go back to our beginning. When we were first born, we had a great instructor, our mom and dad. They, they taught us how to eat, how to breathe. Well, maybe not so much how to breathe, but how to eat, how to clothe yourself. And as you go through, you're going to have a lot of teachers. You go to school, you get an education, you get a teacher, and they'll do their best to give you the basic understandings of what you need to know. And then you might even have, you know, as you go older, a more specific vocational training and teachers all around, always trying to teach you a bunch of things. Well, you'll get to a point in your life where you might not want to listen to your teachers as much. Or you might go, it's like, okay, well, maybe I know all that I need to know. Or maybe those that maybe didn't do too well in school. Well, teachers don't see eye to eye with me. I can't ever learn anything from a teacher. Well, as we sit here today, we all have one teacher in common. It's an unfallible teacher, a teacher whose will is infinite, his knowledge is infinite. And I'm talking about Christ today. Christ is our teacher. Before, before anything, he was there. And he knew he was going to be our teacher. He even sent down the law to come and guide us. So when he came, he'd be like, okay, I'm going to take off. I'm going to take from there, and I'm going to continue the teaching, and I'm going to teach you. And he continues teaching us every single day of our lives. He doesn't stop. He continues. Even those that are lost, there's a teacher for them. Even those that think they're worthless, he's that teacher for them. So every day, remember his teachings and that it's not an ordinary teacher that we have. He's the teacher that was in the burning, the burning bush. He's the teacher of our, the God of our forefathers. He's the teacher of everything. He is the teacher. He is the I am. So we have a video this morning. close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, great worthy none beside 
In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we come in praise and thanksgiving, in worship of you in this morning hour. Thankful that we were able to join in to fellowship once more, firstly and foremostly with you and also with each other. Father, you have brought us unto this point through another week, and even as it is just into the new year, that we would still think back that you brought us through the year past also. And Father, you have continued with us. You, your love continues to be showered upon us and move within us and work within us. And Father, for that, we bring our great thanks. Father, we also know that there are many things that maybe we don't encounter because you have already steered the course. You have already made things a certain way. And in so doing, Father, that also at times makes it easier for us. And so for that too, we bring our thanks. Father, we have come seeking in this morning hour. There are things that we carry, challenges, difficulties, insufficiencies. And Father, we know that you are able to respond to all things and to help us in all things. And on, in, in that mind, Father, then we come seeking, asking, knocking, that you will provide unto us. Father, we bring our thanks to you that you have provided those that will serve in this time, firstly in the apostles' ministry that has been sent, and there are those that fulfill that responsibility. And Father, closer to home too, there are those that you have sent to serve each and every one of us. Father, we bring our thanks unto you for them. We thank you too for everyone that is gathered, for everyone that has connected, that make up our congregation. And in this way, that we have companions to walk through our faith with. Father, we pray too for the activity of your spirit in our, in our midst in this day, that it is in us and among us, that as the words are shared and spoken, that for all of us we can understand as you want us to understand and that it can help us grow more and more into the likeness of your Son. Father, we look unto that time when he comes back and when he will return. We pray that you will continue with us and continue to grant grace unto us that when he comes, we can be found ready and waiting. We pray this in your Son's name and ask that all things be according to your will. Amen. Amen. So, welcome to all of you this morning. We have love and greetings that I can greet you with from our Chief Apostle Schneider, our District Apostle Cole, and our Apostle Orlovsky. Our service this morning is based on a verse that comes out of John, the seventh chapter, and the 16th verse. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. You can be seated. you. So good morning, dear congregation, to those that are here, to those that are connected. Welcome. This morning we start a theme of looking to Jesus. And in this morning in particular, we'll be looking at him as our teacher and um, as our example. 
And so with that, then, there will be some points we look at in Scripture. Certainly, there are we could spend much longer than the time that we have allotted in this morning reminding ourselves how Jesus is our example and our teacher. So we won't pick that many. But to give you a little bit of context as to where our Bible verse comes from, in the seventh chapter of John, if we go back a little bit to the sixth chapter, um, just to kind of give a little bit of a flow, um, at the end of the sixth chapter, uh, which has over 70 verses, um, that was the section of Scripture where uh, Jesus had come, or he was talking with his disciples, and it was the larger number, and had indicated that he was the bread of life, and that um, we would have to eat of his body and drink of his blood. And, and many of the disciples said that's a hard saying. And it's interesting how the um, uh, Scripture puts it in verse 66 of the sixth chapter, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. A very polite way of saying they took off, they left. It was too much. And then at the end um, of this chapter, this is um, a time where Jesus asked the disciples that remained, the twelve, if they also wanted to go away. And Peter responded with, also we have come to know Believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we had that in our service sequence, I think, back in September or October of last year, where that was one of the services. And so then we get into the seventh chapter. And at the beginning of this, it starts in 7-1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And so the time period that we're in was a feast time. This particular feast um, happens in September or October, and it's tied to the Jewish New Year. Um, if I won't go back and read it now in the interest of time, but if you go back to Leviticus in chapter 23 and start in 33 and go on, it talks about the different feasts that the Israelites were supposed to celebrate. Um, there are seven of them outlined there. The Feast of the Tabernacles is one of them. And so we can see that um, even during Jesus' time, there was this understanding of what happened before and a continuation of what happened before. And um, to kind of fill in a little bit of the story here, um, if we continue in John 7, 3 and 4, it says, His brothers said, therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Oh, this is key. Verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. And so here it is. His, his natural biological brothers were there and were surrounding him. They had grown up with Jesus. And yet, Scripture records they didn't believe him, and they were encouraging, go, go show what you do. It's interesting. Verse 6, Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. So he had this sense already. It wasn't his time yet. And so then they departed. We're going to skip a few verses. And then in verse 10, But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. So he ended up going to the feast, and, um, but not as his brothers had uh, suggested or challenged him to. And then if we go to verse 14, it says, now about the middle of the feast, so this is the Feast of Tabernacles, it was an eight-day feast, so midway through the third or fourth, maybe fifth day, doesn't say, but it was in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them, and this is our verse, and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So to give you a little bit of the context behind where our verse comes from. Now, it's interesting, when, when I looked into it a little bit more, this, this word doctrine, it's like, well, okay, let's, what does that mean? Let's dig into it a little bit more. And the word that was translated into English is doctrine, could also very well be translated teaching. And I don't know, it works better for me if it's that way. So it says, my teaching is not mine, 
but his who sent me, referring back to God. And so we have, we have this understanding that Jesus was a... He didn't do anything on his own. Even though he was the Son of God, even though he claims deity, he still gave the example that the Father was the one that made the decisions and directed things and set that example for us even still yet this day. We understand that um, Jesus is authentic. When we look into what he did and how he lived his life and what he taught, there were no difference between him and his person, what he did, and the words he said. In fact, there's some very powerful verses if we go back to the beginning of John. Uh, we'll start in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so this refers to the Lord Jesus, that he was the word, he was the light. And then further in John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as, the, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, what he was before, how he came to be on this earth, and then what he taught while he was here, is genuine, it's authentic. There isn't any, there isn't any contradiction within it. This is good for us, because we can depend on it, we can trust it, we can believe it. The other thing is, is it's also practical. And something that's practical is something that can be practiced and applied. Jesus didn't make it so complicated or so involved that, oh man, you need a legal degree to be able to figure it out or you have to have some great knowledge and understanding to follow what Jesus taught. His doctrine, his teaching is very simple. Put God first and then love God. Put him first and love him and then love everyone else around you. We still, we hear that many, many times even to this day. And, and it's no different than it was back then. It hasn't gotten more complicated. It hasn't gotten more involved. It's still the same and very simple. Maybe some of you noticed I brought an orange with me this morning. No, it's not my breakfast. Even though I haven't had any yet, it's not a big deal, but no, it's not my breakfast. But an orange, I'm gonna pick on an, a, a peculiarity of our language. And I think also maybe the other Romance languages would carry this also. But we call it an orange. And also its color is orange. And if you cut it in half and open it and look inside of it, it's still an orange doesn't matter how big or how small the pieces are, it's always an orange. And that's how it would be described. The word that describes it and what it is and what it contains is all described as the same. And so it is also, I want to be careful not to communicate that Jesus is an orange, but the doctrine that he taught and the way he lived it and the way that he carried it out, you can look at it from any direction you can get into the middle of it. You can look at it from the top or the bottom. It's all the same. Just like the example of the orange. And so, this maybe is a, a picture that we can take with us as we go. The other aspect of Jesus is he's a catalyst. We, um, when we have an encounter with Christ, when we have an encounter with our God, it changes us. We can't help but be changed. And we understand at the end, it becomes a very binary decision. People either decide to be with God and remain with him, or they decide not to. They decide to love God, or they decide not to. There's no in-between. 
And right now, we have the ability to choose. As time progresses on, there will come a point when God will force that the choice is made and it will become binary. And so as we have encounters with him today, it moves us, it impacts us. When we really have an encounter, it, in some cases, it challenges us. Because in his love, he will make it clear where there are things that do not align with what he is and who he is and what his word is. And then in that, we know, hey, I have something I have to work on. I have something I need to change. I have something I need to correct. So as we look into the example and the teaching, um, we're going to look at four different aspects that Jesus demonstrated and that then the uh, encouragement, admonition, is that then we likewise follow in them. The first one, Jesus maintained a connection, or we could also use the word relationship, with his God. How did he do this? Well, even in the verses that we've read already, in John 7, 14, it says, Now in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple. He taught. Um, he was the Son of God, so it would make sense that when he was at the temple, he would be the teacher. But he still went he still made that connection in that way. We also understand that Jesus prayed. He prayed a lot. And there was some teaching on this. Again, practical teaching. If we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, and if we look at Matthew, the sixth chapter, and we'll start in the fifth verse. It says, and when you pray, so this is in blue in this Bible, it's the words of Jesus, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Wow. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So a little bit of a contrast right from our Savior of when we pray. It isn't, it isn't to pray in front of everyone and draw attention to ourselves. But it is such that we go and we come to our Heavenly Father and pray to him. It continues in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And then it continues, in this manner, therefore pray. And we get into the Lord's Prayer that we will again pray today. So Jesus not only went and prayed, but he gave instruction. There's more about prayer. In another part of Matthew that uh, we came across during small group as we were reading through Matthew that we're supposed to pray for the Lord to send um, those that would be involved in the harvest work, his harvest work, to gather souls to him, that there would be those sent to be able to do that work. And, and I'm certain, I haven't looked it all up, but I'm certain there's more in scripture about prayer. So in this way too, Jesus made a connection. He went and prayed in Gethsemane. And then also taught that this is something that we are supposed to do, to spend time in prayer. So there was a couple of other verses on this in order to help us. There were more. I did look up a couple. In John, the 14th chapter, in the 13th verse, and again, the words of Jesus. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So when we pray and we ask God about things, we are encouraged to ask in Jesus' name. Now, we have to understand this here a little bit, 
This isn't, um, well, it, it, it qualifies it. That I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, the things we pray for, the things we ask for, are to be for God's glory. Not for our own. Not for someone else's. But for God's alone. And so then, those things that we ask, when we ask God, hey, you, you want souls to be drawn to you. Help me do that. That would glorify God. That there would be someone else that would come and understand and know the love that he has for us. God will help us with that. If, if it's something just to... Um, I want to be careful with... I won't pick an example, but if there are things that we look at within ourselves, and it's purely for us, for our, our own well-being, absent of anything that God would do or has asked us to do, we could ask those in Jesus' name, but I highly doubt they're going to occur because it doesn't bring glory to the Father. So when we ask for things and we pray for things, consider that. Who does this glorify? Where does the glory go? And let that be a guide for how we pray. And then the last one in Romans. This also is really incredible. Romans 8 and 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes we're really stuck. We're grieving. We're stuck in sin. We're in despair. Stuck in the worst kind of rut. And we want to pray. But we can't find the words. We don't know what they are. And yet... God cares for us. And sent his spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. And so then it says, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. That he makes himself intercession for us. So our prayer is vital. I don't think God would have sent the Holy Spirit and that that scripture would have been given to us. Just because, oh, that was a nice add-on or just in case that's necessary. No, God has a purpose. He doesn't do anything without purpose. And so if it is there and available and we've been told about it, there's a reason for it. And so in this way, we have the teaching that Jesus told us about how we should pray. We have to ask for things in his name. And then even when we're stuck and we feel like we can't pray, maybe we just bow our hands or bow our heads and fold our hands, and we're silent because we don't have the words. And yet in prayer, that's silent. The Spirit makes intercession for us. It's built in to be able to establish our relationship with our Father in this way. He made it, again, simple and practical so that it is, so that no one would be able to say, but I couldn't. It was impossible. It was too much. The burden was too great. The cross was too great. We can't say that. He's made it so that it can always work. Our second point that Jesus showed as an example he showed reverence to our, to our God, to our Heavenly Father. If we look in Luke, in the 18th chapter, and the 18th and 19th verses, now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This was Jesus was around with the people again, and someone came. Called him good teacher, which makes a lot of sense. He's the son of God. He taught. He still teaches us today. He is our teacher, not was. Is our teacher today. Makes sense that he would be called good teacher. Jesus responds. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? 
No one is good but one. That is God. Wow. Here's the Son of God, who, again, if there was someone that we could think of that was good, it would be him. And when he was approached in that way, he then said, no, only the, God, only the Father is good. What an example for us. That, that too, we have to remember. I know sometimes that we joke around with each other. And there might be, uh, I can't think of a good example right now, but pay attention. As you interact with other ones, and especially your close friends, and maybe you like to shuck and jive a little bit and, and, and banter, listen to the words, though. And then later ask yourself, how many of those are really true? How many of those go against what Jesus taught us to say there was only one that was good? It is the Father. It'll be interesting as you ponder over it. I've done it before, and it's like, man, it's really easy to provide credit somewhere else, to call something else good. Sometimes we use the word awesome, which is even higher than good, as I understand it in English. And if good is reserved for God, awesome definitely should be. And yet sometimes you'll hear different, oh, that was awesome. Well, maybe within its own bubble, but by contrast to some other measures, nope, not even close. So listen to your speech. Listen to what you say. Listen to what others say. And, and evaluate it. Our reverence. Our reverence. Um, I, I come from a mathematical background in functions and inversely proportional and proportional and, and so on. And I won't go into any more of those way, kind of words. But our reverence, I wrote it this way, is directly proportional. It's in a relative measure or um, proportion to our closeness with our God. If we are far away from God, reverence is a, a respect and honor if we're far away from God, our reverence won't be that big. Because he doesn't look that big. Uh, I forget when it was. I think it was late last year when there was, it came in service about magnifying the Lord. And how we do that, we have to get close. And when we magnify the Lord, then we have reverence. Something to consider. If we look and say, how is my reverence for God? Oh, it doesn't seem that big. That begs the question then for each one of us. How close are we to our God? And maybe that'll be insightful on, hey, there's something that I need to correct. I need to change. The third example that Jesus set for us, he set proper priorities. we we'll go back to Luke for a moment in the 14th chapter. And we're going to read verses 25 through 27. Now great multitudes went with them, went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Some strong words. It's not that we go home, tell the family, okay, I'm leaving. I'll see you all later. Jesus said, I got to hate everybody. No, no. It's very clear he encourages us to love. But what this testifies to is going back to the two commandments, that we love God first and then our neighbor as ourselves, which in this context then neighbor includes husband, wife, children, aunts, uncles, parents. We love God first. It has to be that way. And this priority, this gets to um, the word that came to mind as an intensity. 
Christianity, being a Christian, being a disciple, is not a passive activity. If you go back to Matthew in chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 with the Great Commission. And even when I read that, the, the English translation talks about making disciples. But in the, I don't know, I'll call it a more literal translation of the Greek, it said to disciple all nations. Go make disciples sounds like, oh, it's a work you go do, and you're there for a little bit, it's a job, you're there nine to five, and then you go home and, and you go back the next day. But instead of the verb being make and disciples being a noun, when disciple is a verb, oh, now our hands are in the mud. Our hands are dirty just like everyone else's. We are discipling through our own example. And so it is that it requires this intensity. When there is work to be done, it doesn't happen if you sit on break all day. you got to go do it. If there's a hole to be dug or, or whatever the activity is, it has to be done. It's an action. Discipling is an action. It is for us that we... It, it, to go make disciples, not to pick on this too much, but it almost sounds like there's a disassociation with it. We're not fully involved. We're not fully invested. But if we take the verb as disciple, then we are invested. We are engaged. And in doing so, then, our priorities will be aligned. And so then we have... Um, We will adhere to the priorities that have been set down, which, again, is very simply, love God and then love our neighbors. And our last example that Jesus gave is to love those around us. I heard over the course of the week the difference between divine love and human love. It struck me. On the one hand, it seems so simple, on the other side, it was so profound and so impactful. Divine love depends on the lover. Human love depends on the loved. Now let me explain that a little bit more. Divine love depends on God and how much he loves. Human love depends on the object that is loved. And the, the, the statement that I heard that really, I think, illustrates this is between um, a husband and a wife, the, the spouse would say about the other one, you're not the person I married. The other individual changed. They grew. Maybe they got ill. Something happened. They changed. And all of a sudden now, the love that was shown to them is in that statement is an indicative of it was dependent upon the state of who was loved. Not dependent upon the lover and the fact that loving them was the right thing to do and the godly thing to do. And that hit me. How many of my relationships as I look at them do I do that way? How many of my relationships do I love in the way that God loves me? Which is independent of whether I sin or not. It's independent of whether I reciprocated or not. It's independent of whether I'm obedient or not. How many of my relationships work in the godly manner of love? Not near as many as I'd like to stand up here and say. That's a challenge. Again, a few practical pieces of encouragement. We hear a lot about our neighbor. And yes, absolutely, that is important. But we also can't look past some of the relationships that are a little bit closer. Okay, so we're going to look at Ephesians 5. And we'll start with 28, because it always goes the other way. We're going to start with 28 and then go to 22. Ephesians 5, 28. Uh, or no, sorry, 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. When we go through our life and look at the practical teaching of Christ, we have to remind ourselves of it. Scripture was given. His word was given. There's no difference between Jesus and his word and his deeds. And so as we ponder over his words and remind ourselves of them and speak them to our own heart, it's worthwhile. It's a help. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Men, that's a tall calling. That's not easy. I know the evangelist talked the last week when he's all the way across town and he gets the call from his wife to go back and, and do something. It's not what he wanted to do. Sure, it wasn't on his agenda. I don't know how many times he does and doesn't. I haven't asked, and if he didn't say, I won't put him on the spot. But there are times where something happens or it doesn't meet what we expect or, or again, going back to this idea of godly love versus human love. Maybe our love is dependent on them and how they were. And now something changes and it challenges our love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. There's more, but that statement alone will help us with a whole bunch of things. Now, wives, you're not off the hook. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It's qualified. Doesn't whatever husband says happens? No. It's a relationship. It's supposed to work together. It's supposed to edify each other as is the relationship between the Lord and his church. That's the model. And in fact, Ephesians 5, it has good practical advice for husbands and wives, but it is more about Christ and his church and the relationship there. And it uses marriage and that relationship between husband and wife to explain the relationship between Christ and his church. And yet, there is still wonderfully practical advice and counsel and guidance contained in that scripture. There's more. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go in any further. But as you read the Bible and find different things, remind yourself of them. It helps. Remind yourself of John 3.16 and 17, that God sent his son because he loved you. When the day's getting hard, when the boss is, is all over you to get work done, when this one or that one maybe doesn't agree with you or doesn't seem to care for you as much as you care for them or as much as you wanted them to care for you, remind yourself that God loves you. Hold on to that. It's good. It helps us. And it is in following this example Even Christ referenced scripture. I won't go back and read it, but when the devil tempted him, he quoted Old Testament scripture back to the devil. He had it inside. He knew it. It would only make sense for us to be the same. So, in summary, Jesus set an example in maintaining a connection and a relationship with his father. He showed reverence before God. He had the priorities set correctly. And he loved all who came. Let him continue to be our example, not just as something we read about, but something that he continues to teach us today and we, and we are discipled in so that we can also disciple others. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us in our hymn of acceptance. Hymn number eight, Glorify Thy Name, we'll be humming the first verse.
You can be seated. So as our thoughts turn towards repentance in Holy Communion, in communication from our district apostle and our chief apostle, we were reminded that, yes, we look forward to a future time when we can exist in fellowship with our God. And we look forward to that. And we anticipate that and can't wait. And yet, the reminder was, in the moments that surround Holy Communion, that fellowship can exist now. Not in the same way that it will be, but it can exist now. We have an idea, we have a sense, we have a feeling of what that is. And so, and, and uh, I need to back up for just a moment, this works because the, as forgiveness is put in place, then the sin that would keep us from our God and would create a wedge between us is no longer there. And so then we are able to move very close. We are able to be very, very close. And so then it is our understanding that once absolution has been rendered, then we have this really nice existence. And we are then able to enter into a very close, personal, and intimate fellowship with our God in these moments where we commemorate once again what Jesus accomplished, the work that he did, and what it means for us, and the, and the opportunity that it still provides to this day. And so it's, yes, something we do every week, but we don't want to forget that what we are about to experience once again came at great cost and great price, the greatest ever. And it was done willfully and lovingly. So with that, we can have the hymn of repentance. I invite you to rise and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the commission of my sender, the Apostle, I proclaim unto you the glad tidings that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven. The peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Dear Father, again, we say thank you. And we could just get stuck saying thank you for a long time. It seems like the best word that we have to express our gratitude and our thankfulness and 
the, the joy that's in our heart, that you have once more considered us, that you have once more provided forgiveness unto us. Again, Father, thank you for this. And as we look forward now to Holy Communion and the moments that are celebrated there, we pray too that this is a wonderful experience, a wonderful encounter. And Father, we bring our thanks unto you for this too, that we are able to once more gain strength. The life of your Son can be our part and it can help with everything that we face, with every challenge that we have, it can help. Thank you for this, Father. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. And now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay thereupon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. Lord now invites you for Holy Communion.
I invite you to rise. We'll close the service with prayer. Dear Father, we come once more to express our praise, our honor, our thankfulness unto you. Thank you for that which has been provided, Father. And we ask, too, that that is the time, the words, the experience, the celebration of Holy Communion. That these things stay with us after we have left, tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, and on until the next time that we are able to come into your house and encounter you. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we go. Grant your angels protection to and keep us and those that, that, that which we leave here. And as well, Father, for each one as they go into their week, whether it's work or school or, or the various activities, Father, that we each can continue to walk into, in the example that your son has set, that we can carry our cross in a dignified way. And that, Father, ultimately, the steps that we walk, the ones that you call us to, will lead us back to the day of your son's return. We pray that you will continue to be with us and grant grace unto us to be ready for that day. Father, for those that have brought offerings and, and made sacrifices, grant your blessing upon them. For those that continue to serve in many ways in our congregation, in our community, Father, help them, bless them, that they may continue and also that they know that they, there is gratitude for that which they do. We pray this in your son's name and ask that all things be according to your will. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You can be seated, and the evangelist cook has um, some things to present to us. Okay, good morning. Happy New Year to everybody. One of the things that uh, we committed to you as a congregation is, as the shared leadership team, we wanted to keep you informed, and we made a promise that on a quarterly basis, we would just update you and kind of share some information about, you know, what happened the last quarter, what's coming in the next quarter. And once a year, we would do this little annual report where we would just kind of touch on a little bit of looking back and then prepare for looking forward. But before I go into the report, I just wanted to share with you, first of all, just a reminder, next Sunday, there is no local in-person services. Our chief apostle is going to do an international um, service, a webcast. So that will be something that they thought it would be best that everybody could watch from their home. And so there will be no communion. There will be no in-person service here next Sunday. But we will have a webcast from our chief apostle that we will get you the details out this week so that you know exactly where to find it and all of the details for the timing and so on and so forth for next week. So first of all, we just wanted to touch base um, as far as a look back and a review of 2020, and like our chief apostle and district apostle had mentioned to us, we can't just look at it last year and like, I can't wait, I'm glad that thing is over, right? And that there was nothing that we learned from there. And we, it's helpful sometimes to look back because we can see God's hand and how he helped us, and he was with us, and he was for us, and how he guided us through such a challenging time. And so there was just a couple of things that I wanted to share. First of all, we didn't, many may be, forget that we still had Eight baptisms, four adoptions, 11 souls sealed with the Holy Spirit, including three adults and eight children. When we look back at these COVID times and we recognize that the church was able to establish a safety and cleaning protocol that to keep our members safe and to allow us to return to in-person services and give us that strength and to be able to experience Holy Communion again. We were also able to connect because of those decisions years ago to establish some of the technology available. A lot of churches, when COVID hit, they didn't know what to do. But we are thankful that our Heavenly Father already inspired those thoughts and prepared us as a congregation that we already had local webcast capabilities, that we already had a lot of the technology that could help us 
connect our congregation even when we were at home and maybe those that were quarantined or maybe those that couldn't get to services, they could connect. And the Lord provided all of that and engineered all of that so that we could still be connected even though we maybe had to be at home. And how many postal services had we had in our lives, you know, and the fact that we were able to have like three months of all apostle services was so special. And even to this day, how we can have not only a local webcast, but also a national webcast. And depending on the time that you can be able to connect, you can be able to connect appropriately. We are also able to establish, though, because some of our members are seniors, and maybe they still have the old flip phone, right? They don't have a technology phone, and so that's okay. And so we were able to establish a local dial-in number that makes it easy for them to still connect because our dear sisters and our dear brothers also wanted to hear the word of God, and that's such a strength to them. So that also, the Lord provided for that. We also want to give you an update on how we were also able to um, coordinate the moving of our small groups from in-person and into a online uh, capability so that they could still connect because that relationship and that growth that was happening still needed to happen and we needed that especially during the times of quarantine and difficulty. So that was also available. And then also we had many people asking about how we could give again because they didn't know they didn't have the offering box that we could be able to put it in person. And so having that digital online platform available for them also so that if it was easier for them to mail it or to put it, do it electronically, they had those options. And so again, the Lord engineered all of these things for us. Now looking at impact. Last year was a tough year for a lot of people. Our food pantry served almost 1,000 people last year. Almost 1,000 people. And that's because of your hearts. That's because of your love. That's because we're sharing his love to our community, to our families and friends, our coworkers, our classmates. And so I'm very proud of and thankful that our Heavenly Father engineered all of that and inspired that in your heart, and we give him all the glory but to just see the impact, a thousand souls, thousand families, a thousand people struggling, the Lord provided for them, and he used us to be those loving channels, those loving conduits, right? When divine resources meet human needs through loving channels, as priest Paul's mentioned this morning, to the glory of God. 102 baskets also were delivered to our seniors, shut-ins, and homebound members. Additionally, our learning and gift boxes were also delivered to our children and families from our children's ministry team to support them and help them. Plus, short Sunday school video lessons have been offered online to help them have a way that they can keep growing as children and growing as learning about the Lord Jesus and his wonderful plan of salvation. Furthermore, one of the benefits of us not being in the building is we could take that time to focus and do um, so, something that we've been working on for quite a few years, and that is how can we make the building more efficient? How can we lower our co energy cost? Because we care about the environment, right? We want to use less energy, and we want to be able to be good stewards. And so we were able to, during this time of COVID, when we were shut down, able to complete a LED upgrade. So now this part of the building had always been when the renovation LED, and now we were able to complete the fellowship hall and all of the conference rooms and the Sunday school rooms. And even the outside uh, area now is all LED to cut our costs. And we've already started to see $500 to $700 a month in savings just with those um, small upgrades and changes. So uh, kudos, our dear Art Jolliffe and uh, Priest uh, Smith were instrumental in you know, coordinating a lot of that. And so we really appreciate that. But we also wanted to let you know we're trying to look at be good, being good stewards, too, of God's resources so that we can use them to be, do the work of ministry. So then uh, also we had seven families that we supported for the Adopt-A-Family. So this past uh, Christmas season, we were able to support seven families with gifts and support for them as they were going through a tough time. So just again, we appreciate all those that took things off from the, the list, helped out with uh, funds to help our our team kind of go and find those resources to be a blessing, to help somebody have a good Christmas in a very difficult time and season that we've had. And then the chief apostle, had, or a district apostle, had asked the question. He said, where did you grow, and how were you transformed this past year? So now as we look forward, 
part of our mission that we've been asking ourselves as a shared leadership team. And the shared leadership team, if you uh, um, don't know or don't remember, is Priest Paul's, is our divine service experience leader. He leads that area. And again, we want to use the term lead, not in charge. That's an old school term that we are not going to use anymore. Nobody's in charge. I'm not in charge of you. You know, I've been asked to lead you as a rector, but I'm not in charge of you. Priest Paul's isn't in charge of the divine service experience. He's leading the divine service experience. Sister Bonnie Miller, Miller is leading our outreach team, and so we're thankful for her. Priest Smith leads our structure team, which looks after the building and flowers and decorations and so on. He leads that area. And then Priest um, Heidema has been leading our pastoral care team, but because of some health difficulties, now he has had to step away and he's transitioning out of that position. And he has asked Sister Dana Cook to now fulfill that role. And he has been working with her at training her into that role. And so she will be filling that role here moving forward. So our members again are Priest Pauls, Priest uh, Smith, um, Sister Bonnie Miller, Sister Dana Cook, and then also Pete Vaness is our financial person. And we have him on there because he took the place in transition for Sister Dee Mawendabai when she moved, had to move to Texas because of her job transfer. And so he fills that role of being uh, one that audits things, that helps us be good stewards, looks after the finances to make sure that we're keeping things all up and up and making sure that we're always looking at uh, keeping things in a proper manner. So then as far as the question that we had as we met back in October was, why did God put you and I here in Portage? Right? Every church is placed in an area for a reason. God has placed us as part of the church of Jesus Christ. He's put us as the body of Christ, and he has put us right here in Milam as part of the church of the New Apostolic Church. And he's asked us to be his representatives. What is he asked us to be? And so we put together a purpose statement. It was one of the things that we challenged the um, shared leadership team that we could pray about. What has the Lord inspired us to do? What has he called us to be? And so we wanted to share that uh, purpose statement with you. So if the team would share that up there with you. And I think it's really nice because it, it goes along with not only today's service, but it makes it nice and simple and easy for us to remember. To shine the light on Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, right? By making God's love tangible to people in our community. To shine the light on Jesus Christ by making God's love tangible to people in our communities. Tangible means real. Tangible means something that they can see, touch, experience, and feel. Because so often, people think of God up there and forget that God is right here. He is in you, as our priest had mentioned in the service this morning. And he's using you to be his lover of souls. To show that love and make it tangible so that you can make it real for people in your communities. A coworker, a neighbor, somebody in your apartment complex, somebody you go to school with, our young people. I'm really going to encourage you to take this to heart. That how can you make God's love tangible to people at your school, to people that you talk with in your language, and you can connect with them in a certain way. So think about how can you make God's love tangible to people in our community. That's where our purpose statement is here for Portage. Next, we wanted to kind of give a, a, a focus to this year because, you know, there's tons of things, right, we can do. It's kind of like when you talk to NASA and you ask them, what is NASA's purpose? To explore space, right? But what is their mission? Years ago, it was to get to the moon, right? Now I think it's to get to Mars. What is our mission? Our mission is, first of all, a few things. One, discipleship. We're going to focus on discipleship. How can we grow and become an active disciple of Jesus Christ? And as part of that, we're going to do a couple of things. One, can we get 50% of our congregation involved in a small group? You grow in so many ways in a small group. You learn of him, and you learn from each other. I can just share personally, I can't tell you how many times I've learned from Sister Florence, 
a comment that Dorothy has made, a comment that Priest Heidema has made, a comment that Dan Gerhardt has made, a comment that Will has made. So we're learning of him, but we're also learning from each other and how the Holy Spirit has awakened gifts in us all. And it's so beautiful to experience. So we learn of him, we learn about each other, we learn how to walk out our faith in our daily lives. We learn how the service and what message came out, how we can apply that in our daily walk. So it's really powerful that in small groups, it helps us grow in our faith. And then third, it's a weekly encouragement along our journey of faith. It gets tiring sometimes, doesn't it? As our priest mentioned in service, sometimes it's tiring. And yet the Lord provides that weekly encouragement when we have those small groups. So we really would love to see us get to 50% of our congregation involved in a small group. If you're not, please see one of us. And we'll help you. If you want to start one in your area, you're down in, in Three Rivers, or you're down in um, Battle Creek, or you're over here, if it's a young people and you want to get a young adults group together, we'll help support you. We'll give you the tools, the training, and we'll support you. A lot of times we're meeting online right now because of COVID, and that will probably continue. And so there's easy ways for you to connect. And so we can let you know that there's a men's group on Monday. There's going to be a ladies' group starting up. There's a, couple, there's a, a Bible study that they're really focusing in on, on, a, on the Bible on Wednesdays. We have another group that meets on Wednesdays. Whenever you want to meet, whatever works convenient for you, we're also investigating how we can make things easier for families so that we can provide some child care so that families and those couples can be able to have some time to grow in as a disciple of Jesus Christ as well. But we want to just share this. We want to be open and honest and work together at this, right? That this is an important thing, and we know that we grow closer to him from this. We grow closer to one another from this. And isn't that what priest Paul's had just served about? Love God and love our neighbor? And doesn't it have to start at home first? The second part of this is can we get to 80% of our congregation serving in our, act, in our congregation? We're a family. And as I was a young kid, it wasn't just my brother or my sister that was serving. My mom and dad asked, we all had to serve, right? We are a family. We all had our parts and places, and we all had our things that we needed to do. Sometimes I had to do the dishes. Sometimes my sister had to do the dishes. Sometimes she would cook. Sometimes I would have to take out the garbage. We all had our part of that family, and we want to share that with us as a spiritual family, that we all need to help out in some way, right? Find your place. Don't look at what you can't do. Look at what you can, right? And you can, a lot of times I hear it from members, but I don't really have a lot of talents, Remember the parable of the talent? Did it matter if they had five or one? When they put that one to work to the glory and honor of our Heavenly Father, didn't Jesus look at them and grant them a special blessing? I look at our dear sister here, Sister uh, um, Cece Falcone. You know, she's now stepping up to help out because our dear sister Kimmer used to take care of sending out the, the calendars to everybody. She used to be the one that was organizing the information center. She used to be the one that would make sure there was no conflicts. And now she's stepping up and she calls me up. She says, I want to learn how to do this. I want to be a blessing. I want to help. And then she finds us. She says, I kind of love this. This is kind of fun. This is what I enjoy. This is what I love to do. And she's finding her gift. She's finding her joy in serving. The Bishop Tesmer used to always say that, didn't he? There's joy in serving. And we want to have a greater joy. And so please, let's, let's work towards that. And then the second part is this worship. And worship is understanding that we are not a congregation that's just a traditional worship. We're not a congregation that is just a modern, new, band-only um, church. We are a blended worship. And that means we're using Psalms 150 as our example, where he talks about, the psalmist does, about using this and using that. No matter what it is, let's use it all to the glory of God. And so we have a blended worship experience. And as part of that, you know what? Kids, sometimes they don't understand the traditional hymns as much, but today's modern hymns mean something to them and touch them. And so you're going to see this blended worship example so that these young people can feel like it's their church too, and that they can get something that moves them and touches them too in a special way. Much like a, maybe a traditional hymn will us. 
So we'll see that blended worship, and I just want to have you kind of hold us all accountable. We're going to work together at that, and we're going to be united in, in trying to be a blessing to our Heavenly Father. And it's not one form is better than the other, but we appreciate them both, and we all are doing them to his glory and his honor. So last, I want to just also focus this idea of worship with our younger generation. Our younger generation, we have to let them know that this is their church too. And as leadership, the shared leadership team, all you young people, we want you to know this is your church just as much as it is ours. We care about you. You mean something to us. And we want you to feel like you can help out, you can serve along, you can get a small group together, you can sing, you can get a part of this congregation. And so I encourage all of us, this is a multi-generational congregation, we're a family. We all want to do this together. And so we call now our young people, we want you to know we believe in you, and we want to give you opportunities to serve, but we need you to lean in. We need you to kind of step in. And parents, we need you to kind of work with your children at developing some of the musical programs, right? Let them learn to play the piano. Let them learn to play the guitar. Let them learn to play the drums. Let them learn to play those instruments and then teach them how they can use them to God's glory. So we're going to be very intentional about engaging our, our children from 5 to 20, 35. We really want to engage them into the congregation. And so we just want to make sure that you as, le- as a younger generation, you know from us as the uh, leadership team, from me as the rector, that we believe in you. And we want to help you find your place in the congregation and discover your gifts and how you can be a blessing to uh, our congregation. Okay? So this is our mission and this is our focus for this year. And so we want to um, all be able to share this. And so I'll get this out to you so that you know. And I just ask that you kind of lean in and that we work together at this. And that's kind of what a family does when we kind of work together at, um, in working in this wonderful work of love. And so then, just two things I wanted to touch on. One, people have asked me often about your core values. What are the core values of the congregation? How do we behave? What defines us as a congregation? And so we wanted to share what those are. And those are humility. Jesus modeled humility, didn't he? It's not all about me. It's all about him, right? Thankfulness has... uh, priest mentioned in his prayer, right? Sometimes we use the word thanks, and it seems like we can't think of anything else because it's just, it's so appropriate that we're thankful. Commitment. This is something we have to work on a little bit, right? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Don't be 50%. Don't be halfway. Be committed. When you say you're going to be here, be here, right? When you say you're going to care for something, care for it. Do your best. Commitment. Jesus, was Jesus committed to us? Did he stop and say, ah, I don't feel like it today. I got a lot going on. <laughs> I don't think I can die on the cross, right? Did he uh, think of that? No. He gave his all. He was committed. He was fully in. And so we encourage and ask that that's going to be a, a core value of our congregation, Next is encouragement. The world in itself and life in itself is discouraging enough, isn't it? We need to encourage each other in our small groups, in our serving, in our uh, uh, walking and through life that we can know that we're not alone, that we can reach out to one another and help each other, okay? Obedience. This is not to me. This is not to our um, SLT team, but this is to the will of God. We as a congregation have to be committed to that and be focused on doing his will and not our own. And then last, that we have a servant's heart. That just as Jesus still, he called us to serve and he was an example of that serving, we also want to be those servants and have that servant's heart that we want to just, wherever you need us, whatever we can do, however we can be a blessing, we just want to be a blessing to our church, to our community, to our families and our friends. Okay? And then last is I just wanted to, people often ask about what is unique about the New Upstyle Church. And this is, I think, some really key things for you to just kind of make note of when somebody's asking you about your church. It's really nice for you to just be able to say, here's some of the uniquenesses about our church. 
We are Christ-centered. We are Bible-based. We have a lot of um, similarities, is the word right? Similarities with the body of Christ because we're connected to the body of Christ. But here are some distinctives that are our church that a lot of times people are asking about. Here, here is what it is. Return of Christ focused. That is really what we are focused on, right? Because we want to, him to come, not because we're trying to get away, but because we love him. And we can't wait to see him. And that's why us as a church, we are so focused at the return of Christ. That is such a priority, and that will always be our priority, right? Second, we're a lay ministry volunteer church. That's a uniqueness about us. We don't have any paid staff. Not any paid ministers. There's not anything paid. We're not political, right? It's all lay ministry and volunteer church. That's a distinctive of our church. Third, apostle ministry led. We're led by that apostle's ministry. And what is that apostle's ministry? Making sure that we're aligned with the gospel of Jesus Christ and making sure that we're prepared and focused on the, his son's return. Next, we have a blended worship style, as we just talked about, right? That's a uniqueness to our church. Fifth, we're a local, here in Portage, national, NAC USA, international, NAC International Church. That's a uniqueness. That's a cool thing. That's not so, I think that a lot of people, when they hear that, are like, wow, that's cool. I never realized that. And they can see that connection and that there's that oneness about how a service in Germany is using the same Bible verse as we are here in Portage today. They may be five hours earlier, but that Holy Spirit and love, that oneness that we have, that you can go here into Florida, you can go to Charleston, South Carolina, you can go to California, and no matter what congregation you go to, we're using the same Bible verse, and we all have that same ministry. Sixth, we have a shared leadership model, right? It's not this hierarchy of, hey, this uh, elder and this uh, um, senior pastor and executive pastor and separate pastor, and, and we have all of this hierarchy. We have a shared leadership team model, right? That's why it's so important that we're a family and we all serve so that we can work together as a family. And we're looking at finding what is the best for the congregation from a shared leadership model example. And last, this is really aligns us probably with all current ch Christian churches though, but as distinctive salvation for all souls, right? We have a desire for salvation for all souls. So these are just some of the things that we wanted to touch on with you. There, we'll try to get this into the report on the, the website and share that with you so you can see it later. You'll see some of these different things in more details. But the question that I'd like to ask for you in conclusion is how can you make, or how can you shine the light on Jesus and make God's love tangible to people in your circle? And what can you do to support our mission and how can you contribute to these goals as a congregation and being a blessing to our community? And the whole idea here is what? We want to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because it says there in the end, right? When Jesus came, there were those that were what? Lukewarm. We don't want to be lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But we don't want to be lukewarm. We are being called this year to run the race. Jesus is running with us. He's that model and example, and he's setting the pace. We need to kind of step up. We need to come together. We need to be those that are putting our gifts and talents and following him and trying to follow that pace that he's setting for us so that his life can be experienced through us and his love will be tangible in people in our communities and his love can be tangible to us. Okay? So hopefully this is helpful. You know, sometimes we like to just share the, the, the vision for the future and for the uh, year, but we also are going to share, send out a, some feedback to you. We're going to have a little uh, survey again that we're putting together for you that if there's something in your, the community that you think we could be a blessing for, if there's a community organization, a nonprofit group that we can help or could be a blessing, please share that. If there's something about a small group that's holding you back from being a part of it, let us know what that is. We want to try to help solve those problems or those dilemmas or those challenges. And so please, as that survey comes out, we want your feedback on ways that we can improve and continue to grow as, as a congregation. 
and as a leadership team as well. Okay? So in conclusion, we got a little song to sing together. It's called The God of This City. Okay? You can stand. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. 